Well, yesterday I said that I was going to talk to you about a passage that uh, has been on my heart for years. I've, I've memorized scripture, uh, but then there's also a bunch of Bible that I, I've, for every day of the week that I look at just to keep reminding myself of stuff uh, that I seem likely to forget uh, along the way. And uh, so I told you that the passage, I almost titled the, you know, titled the, the sermon, you know, what, what do you do when two and a half million people steal your life? But I said the word idiot yesterday, and you guys will be involved in leadership. You'll understand that there's things that you think that you can't always say, but these guys are idiots. They really are. Uh, and uh, and they, they mess stuff up for a guy who didn't deserve it. And I want to talk today about how he came through that. It's a legacy thing. And uh, so... <laughs> Wait, let's try this again. Got it. Um, I can point to several times in my life when God did something significant. You know, it, it was the, the equivalent of slapping me upside of the head. You know, do you understand this? And, uh, and I did. And I had a chance to teach Deuteronomy over the years a couple times. And these words here in chapter 32, when Moses said to Israel, take to heart all the words, not just the ones you like, all the words by which I am warning you today, why do I need a warning? Because I tend to be an idiot, okay? That you may command them to your children, not just for me, for those who come after me. That they may be careful to do all the words. This is not something I can do carelessly. Careful to know the words of this law. For it is no empty word for you, but your very life. This and a combination of three or four other verses were part of what God used to set me on a life direction. Uh, and it has not turned out the way I planned at all. But I can, looking backwards, I can see how I got here. And today I want to talk to you about something really simple, except that it's not. Because other people don't always help us to do it. I want to talk about, I want you to follow God wholeheartedly. Now, we're going to have one of the world's longest introductions to a shorter sermon uh, here. But I got to do the introduction to make sure you're on the same page with me. Uh, the, the passage we're going to look at is in Joshua, eventually. But to get there, we've got to go through this one. I want to talk about why we need to be holy, that's the ESV, wholeheartedly, NIV, I'm using that this morning, wholeheartedly uh, devoted to God, even if others aren't. Follow them if they don't. Now, so this is not going to work unless you actually get your Bible open. I don't have the scripture on the screen. I need you to get your Bible open and, and read this along with me when I go through here so you can spot the stuff that, that I'm pointing out to you. The character we're looking at today, you know, we've looked at five so far this week. The character we looked at today is a guy named Caleb. And there's a surprising amount of stuff about Caleb in the Old Testament, both here in Numbers and in Joshua and in Judges. And so in chapter 13, the chapter starts with a direct command from God, right? Numbers 13. The Lord said to Moses, a direct revelation to Moses, well, what did God want? I want you to choose some men to explore the land of Canaan. Now, they were south of it at that time in a city called Kadesh Barnea. And so they were south of it at the time. And he says, listen, to make this thing fair, we'll do it like the U.S. Senate, right? To make this thing fair, choose one person from each one of the 12 tribes. So everybody gets to be represented. And he sent them out. And then we get the list, starting in verse 4 down through verse 15. You notice they're in verse 6 from the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. And then uh, down in verse 8 from Ephraim, Hosea, son of Nun. And then you find out down in verse 16, Moses gave Hosea, son of Nun, the name Joshua. So 12 spies, two of them you may know more about. So here's the directions from Moses, verse 17. Go up through the Negev, the south part of the land. Go to the hill country. Now look here for a second. You guys are in the Mediterranean Sea. This is the River Jordan right here. In between, we have Israel. Down by the sea, there's sea level, right? Okay. And so 
this is all flat land going down through here. By the time we get over to you guys, we're in the, the hills, the highlands of Judah, and it's sharp, sharp hills, and a lot of climbing. And then you come over here, and it's just like what you see right here on the edge. It drops off down to the Jordan. So they started out back there in the back, someplace between us and the soundboard, and they moved north into the land, and they gave us back there in the back, and then they came to this part right here. They didn't go down there. They came to this part right here, and this is what Moses wants from them. See what the land's like. Verse 18. What are the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many? What kind of land they live in, good or bad? What kind of towns they live in, walled, fortified? How's the soil, fertile, poor? Are there trees? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit. It was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up from the desert of Zin, back there between us and the soundboard, as far as Rehob, toward Lebo Hamath. Well, if they went all the way up, and Lebo Hamath is way up in the north. It's, I mean, it's north of Damascus. And so, I mean, these guys went at, they went at least 200 miles and back in 40 days. And it says, verse 23, when they got to the valley, of, well, no, we can't skip 21. They went up and explored the land, that was in as far as Rehob, toward Lebahamoth. They went up through the Negev, came to Hebron. We'll need that name later. Northern city in the highlands. And there they list these people, Ahiman, Shishai, Talmai. The descendants of Anak lived. And in case you didn't know, Hebron had been built seven years for Zoan in Egypt. That gave them a little bit of historical perspective. When they got to the Valley of Eshcol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Now, you could go down to Wise, and you could buy a single cluster of grapes. You would not need to take two friends along with you and mount the grapes on a pole to bring it back to the dorm. A cluster of grapes like that big. This one took two guys to carry. This was not a bad place to live, along with pomegranates, which I could take a pass on, and figs, which are pretty good. The place was called Valley of Eshkol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. So 40 days, they're back home. Now, here we get in the problems. They came back to Moses and Aaron, the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. They reported them to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. Okay, grapes. They gave Moses this account, 12 spies, right? We went into the land you gave us. And it does flow with milk and honey. Why those words? Because those were the words that God had used to describe the land that he was promising to his people. Flowing with milk and honey. It's a figure of speech, right? Not a bad place to live. Pleasant. But, verse 28, people who live there are powerful, cities are fortified, and very large. We even saw the descendants of an act there. Hmm. In case you're curious about that, you can go dig around the first part of Genesis where they seem to be mentioned. If you can find a pugnacious, you know, young theologian, he'll talk to you about it for hours. Um, God, God told us enough about this that we don't know a lot. But they were large. Large humans. And the Amalekites who were there, they live in, in the south Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites, they're up in the hill country. Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. And you can imagine what happens. This is great, except for the people. Now, one of the things I sometimes comment to my coworkers is, yeah, well, we, we're on a Christian campus, so of course there's a lot of rumors. We know the Bible is against rumors. Uh, but, but it happens anyway, right? And you can just see the people start to say, wait a minute, there's parasites, there's Canaanites, and, and the tall guys? I'm not sure I want grapes that badly. And so they're, they're talking to each other. And verse 30, Caleb silenced the people. Moses said, before, and said, we should go up and take possession of the land. We can surely do it. The other 10 guys, verse 31, who had gone up and said, we can't attack these people. They're stronger than we are. Yes, of course they are. They work at it. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. You were there 40 days and you brought back 80 pounds of grapes. How do you know this? 
All the people we saw there were of great size. Oh yeah, this happened to you when you were going to school. Mom, everyone wears these, can't I have some? All the people there of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. You know, the son of an act, here's your Genesis connection, come to the Nephilim. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we look the same to them. Okay, things are sliding downhill fast. 14, chapter 14. That night, all the members of the Israelite community raised their voices and wept aloud. They grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole assembly said to them, if only we had died in Egypt. Really? Or maybe in the wilderness. Bad choice coming. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land? Only let us fall by the sword. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder by all these tall warrior guys. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Dear Pharaoh, could we be slaves again, please? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Hmm. I want to ask you, this happened at night, right? There's no street lights there. How could they see each other? How could they see each other, talk to each other? What? Yeah. There was a pillar of fire burning. Where's God? I mean, nobody ever knew the will of God better than these people did. The cloud's moving, I guess we'll go. Cloud stopped, I guess we'll stay. <laughs> there it was. In the light that he was providing for them by his presence, they're saying, why did God bring us out here to kill us? That's where I got the word idiots. <laughs> okay? Because they're just like us. They're just like us. I've done this. And if you haven't, you will. Standing there in the light of his truth and his revelation, saying, I don't really think God can do much. Should have stayed in Egypt. Maybe we'll die in the wilderness. Going to lose our families. We should go back to Egypt. We'll find somebody to take us there. Things are heading the wrong direction. So, verse 5, Moses, Aaron fell face down in front of the people. Joshua, son of Nun, Caleb, son of Jephunneh were among there. They tore their clothes, sign of grief, and said to the Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord's pleased with us, he will lead us that land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He'll give it to us. Only don't rebel against the Lord. And don't be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection's gone. The Lord's with us. How did he know that? Because the Lord is with him. Don't be afraid of them. But the whole assembly talked about stoning him. Then the glory of the Lord appeared at the tent of meeting to all the Israelites. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs I performed among them? And then there follows some fascinating stuff. 10 plagues in Egypt, opening the Red Sea, destroying the armies of Egypt, breaking a rock open to give them water when they were thirsty, providing manna every day, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, God's prophet Moses and Aaron. How long will they treat me with contempt? If they could, you and I could. But Caleb didn't. Caleb saw the same thing in the land that these guys had seen. But he saw them through eyes that had been taught by God. Sure, high walled city. Sure, very tall warriors. Very great God. Does that matter? It did for Caleb. So what follows here is an intriguing conversation we're not going to go through between Moses and God. 
where God says, I'll wipe them all out. And, and Moses is, in effect, arguing with him. It, it's, it's not a bad thing to read through and think about your own prayer life. How do you talk with God? Because God knew what he was going to do. He just had to bring Moses along. And he used the conversation to make it happen. And then by the end of it, what God says is, okay, <laughs> you want it? You got it. You gave me options. You said, get taken care of by the Canaanites. You said, go back to Egypt. You said, it'd be better to die in the desert. You got it. Every single one of you, except the children who you said were going to be taken captive, I'll take them in the land. The rest of you, you're going to die in the desert over the next 40 years. And there stood Caleb, who did not have walking in the desert for 40 years with two and a half million disobedient people on his short list of life activities. This is what I get for following you. I came back and gave a great report. And now I've got to walk 40 years in the wilderness? I mean, what do you do when people seem to snatch your life away? Israelites here learned that you can choose your sin but you don't get to choose the consequences of your sin. God forgave Israel, but they then lived with the outcome of it. So that's the historical background and the introduction to this. You follow God wholeheartedly because he keeps his promises. Let's move ahead 45 years to Joshua chapter 14, verses six through 15. We're going to have 45 years. 40 years there in the wilderness. There have been five years of conquest in the land. They've worked all the way through it. And finally, we hit a point where, verse 6, now the people of Judah, remember Caleb was from Judah, approached Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, you know, Joshua, you know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. I was 40 years old, Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my fellow Israelites who went up with me made the heart of the people melt in fear. So what did he do? I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land of which your feet have walked will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. And now then, just as the Lord promised, he's kept me alive for 45 years this time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me that hill country that the Lord promised to me that day. You yourself heard the Anakites were there. <laughs> give me the place with the high walls and the tall guys. The cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. Do you see what's going through this guy's mind? Do you see how he kept himself together? Back in Numbers, Caleb followed the Lord wholeheartedly, twice already here. And then verse 13, Joshua blessed Caleb the son of Jephunneh and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. And so Hebron belonged to Caleb son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite ever since because he followed the Lord, the God of Israel, wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly, fully. It's just, just the word for, you know, take a vessel, fill it up with something, no more room inside. It was all he did. It was all he thought about. When he found out what God said, he did it. He followed God wholeheartedly. What do you do when someone wrecks your plans? What do you do when someone messes your life? You follow God wholeheartedly. I, I could, if I brought Diane up here, I, we, could, we could take the rest of the morning telling you stories about people that we know that did or didn't do this and what happened because of that. Because two and a half million people in the desert out there said, well, I'm not going to follow God. I don't see this working out. And two guys said, God's spoken. 
That pretty well clears things up, doesn't it? You and I can live that way. Whatever things are written in an earlier time, Paul told the Romans in chapter 15, were written for our encouragement that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. But what do you do when people mess up, when they don't follow God? You do. Because God keeps his promises. That's a lot of walking in the desert. That's a bunch of battles. But it was his life. You keep on filling your mind with the word of God and the truth of his work and you move ahead. Is it scary? Yeah, if you read in Judges chapter 1 about how Caleb actually carried out the conquest of the region, you'll see. But it could be you. Now, you know, the vantage point I have at my age is different than the vantage point most of you have at your age. You know, I'm here looking back and you're here looking forward and I can see stuff looking back that you can't see looking forward. But I've met people like this. People who were faithful. Our Phelps Student Center over here is named after Russell Phelps, who was a Binghamton businessman, Wheaton graduate, sold insurance, he invested in real estate all his life. He died last year at 105. 105. And he was still working right up to a couple days before he died. Um, as a layman, he came back from World War II and he was an accountant. And somebody said, that little school over there in First Baptist Church, Johnson City, needs a treasurer. And so Russ became the treasurer of what was called BBS, Baptist Bible Seminary in Johnson City, for six years until he joined the board in 1951. He was a board member for 60 years and then went on emeritus, you know, by virtue of honor, for all the years after that. Um, he is the single largest lifetime donor to our school over the years. And what he did was he would buy a house and he would do a rent to buy thing with people. You know, you, you leave here, you, you don't have a great job, but you're feeding yourself. The bank is not going to look at you for a mortgage. You go talk to Russ. And Russ says, yeah, I'll put you in there. And you pay me rent for the next few years. And once you've proven that you're faithful at that, then you go to the bank with that proof, they'll give you a mortgage. I asked him once, how many people have you done that for? He said, oh, oh, Jim, I don't know, thousands, thousands. Every one of them heard about Christ across from his desk. Every, he witnessed to every one of them. At his funeral, they have those times that people stand up and talk. And like a, we did that little exercise yesterday. Sometimes those are a little scary. Um, so I'm watching these guys stand up. Well, I, I didn't have a lot of money and I went to see Mr. Phelps. They all called him Mr. Phelps. Went to see Mr. Phelps and, and he thought that he could see a way for me to get into a house and he shared Christ with me and I received Christ. There were six of them like that. Faithfulness all through his life. So a few years ago, we gave him an honorary doctor. I think it was 103 when I gave it to him. Uh, and... He couldn't speak in, chap in, in the, the community. What am I looking for? Commencement service. Uh, so some of the faculty have seen this. Uh, but staff, you guys probably haven't, and the students haven't either. So we're going to take the next six minutes, and I'm going to introduce you to Russ Phelps in its own words. He's a character. Let's go ahead and run the, the video. My brother and I started out as professional killer. We had a contract with my mother she paid us one penny per fry, a dead fry, that we could show her it was taken care of properly. That lasted a little while, and suddenly one day, she found the screen door open. That ended our business. We immediately went bankrupt. Time passed by, and she taught us, as the pastor of our church, Pastor Walker at that time, taught us the scripture. We found that we were sinners like everybody else. We needed salvation. 
in Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we both made a decision for Christ. I was 10 years old at the time. We were both baptized. And my father was baptized at the same time. He had baptized previously, uh, but not by a person after being saved. So he felt he should be baptized again to cover that point correctly, according to the scripture. My mother wanted us to become missionaries, and she made that very evident to us. During the great uh, Wheaton College revival, I dedicated my life to the Lord and agreed to go and do whatever he called me to do. I graduated from uh, high school as president of the Binghamton High School Honor Society. I went to Wheaton College and received a BA degree in business and economic. Completed the four-year course in three years by taking extra courses and going to summer school. I never attended graduation because I needed to get home to work. So I arranged with the school to mail me the my certificate, and as far as I know, it didn't cost me anything extra for that. For nearly 60 years, I taught the men's Bible class. In fact, I taught it till I was 99 in three months, and I thought it was time for somebody to talk that was a little bit quicker with the words than I was, and somebody at least knew a little bit more about what was being taught than the students did. So at 99 and three months, I terminated my teaching of the men's Bible class. I got back from the military. One of the first things that happened was a call from Baptist Bible Seminary of Johnson City. <clears throat> I was familiar with that organization. My father was a member of the board and my pastor was a member of the board. The call was one asking me if I would be willing to uh, temporarily uh, become treasurer of the school. Uh, Mr. George Ives, the CPA, had been the treasurer, and he was being called into the military as I was leaving and coming home. I told him I'd be glad to pray about it overnight. I'll call him tomorrow. Probably I would be willing to do that. It seemed to me like a step in the direction I told the Lord I'd be willing to do. He gave me something to do that I was trained to do. I wanted to do what I had agreed to do. And I loved the Lord so much for providing that connection. And I have been connected with the fine school, now Clark Summit University, for 70 years. Maybe longer than that. Time goes by. <clears throat> and I have endured my time uh, here uh, at the school uh, in various ways. Uh, meeting people on the board from all over the country. Being acquainted with the different presidents. In fact, I've been well acquainted with every president of the school from the very beginning. And it has been a blessing and an opportunity to encourage them by way of advice. There are two things that come to my mind. One is something that's written in a book by the wife of Jack Welch, former president of General Electric. She wrote, any big decision that you need to make in life, think about how it's going to affect your family, yourself, and the community in tens. 10 days, 10 months, 10 years. 
a pretty good suggestion of what to do. I also have another suggestion, and I think probably this is very important to all people from a school such as Clark Summit University. Love the Lord, follow the Lord, serve the Lord. May God bless you. Get my PowerPoint back there. So that's early on. That's the president sitting there is Dr. Paul R. Jackson, 1946 and 1960. And Russ is in the back, second from the right, as our charter was renewed. He was part of all that process for us as a school. You've seen that picture in the student center over and over again. And uh, here was when we gave him the doctorate. And we'd go out for lunch with him, Chinese restaurant, and uh, we'd be shouting at each other because he was hard of hearing. Uh, I mean, like really hard of hearing. Uh, and uh, it made everyone, everyone, everyone knew Clarkson University's business in that restaurant. Uh, <laughs> and, and he always would give me a folder from his 60 years of minutes. He says, hey, Jim. It's, uh, I know you're solving problems down there. Here's a problem we had that God solved. You need to read this. Don't quit. And he quote Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 to me. See, he was one of these guys that God gave me in my life to show me how to follow God wholeheartedly. I could give you all kinds of reasons why my life is difficult. It's present here. The president solved problems. That's why they exist. Okay. Problems are my job security. I am very secure. And, you know, but that's, it, it, it's, it's, it's what we got. But in the back of my mind, there's Caleb. In the back of my mind, there's a guy who learned from Caleb, like Russ Phelps. What small choice can you make today? What small choice can I make today that will sustain us in the power and the plan of God to just keep on going, even if nobody around us thinks that following God's a great idea. It is. Let's pray. Father, thanks for our students we have here, for our faculty, for our staff, and good people you've given us to work with. We're grateful for that and uh, grateful that you are just as much here in the room as any of us are. So build us up, sustain us, and carry us on for our next small steps, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. See you guys later. <laughs> <laughs>